Part 2 of this series was going to be an exploration of the significance of NIST's admission that World Trade Center Building 7 underwent a period of freefall acceleration. That'll have to wait for Part 3. After suggesting in Part 1 of this video that John Gross's method for determining the time of fall might constitute dry labbing, in other words, falsifying measurements to support a predetermined outcome, I got curious to know exactly what event he picked to start the clock. The measurement is a little tedious, but the result is very significant. That's often the way it is in science, so stay with me on this one. Let's start with John Gross's explanation of how he determined the time of fall. By the way, you might recall this was not the question he was asked, but it is the answer he gave. Uh, our calculation was uh, based on the amount of time from the uh, top of the parapet uh, to fall till it uh, disappeared from view between the two buildings uh, seen in the uh, video. Uh, that um, uh, time was uh, established from the uh, uh, video uh, by a uh, single frame. Um, uh, search of the, of the uh, time, so that was down to one thirtieth of a second. Um, and then we did the same thing for when the top of the parapet uh, disappeared. Uh, we found that, um, that time to be uh, 5.4 seconds. To identify the point he picked as the start of collapse, we have to work backward. The ending point of his measurement was when the roof line came down to the level of the 29th floor. In our video, there's a structure on the roof of a foreground building that lines up with the 29th floor of Building 7, so it's easy to identify. I imported the video into a measurement program called Video Point, which has a frame counter, and stepped forward to the frame where the roof line lines up with the foreground marker. That's frame 178, counting from the first frame of the video clip I'm using. At 30 frames per second, 5.4 seconds comes out to be 162 frames. Subtracting this from frame 178 brings us to frame 16. So let's go back and see what's happening at or about frame 16. I put a red mark on frame 16, so as it goes by, you'll recognize it. Let's go back to the beginning and step through this section of the video. Watch for the beginning of the collapse. This is frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. We're up to frame 30. Did you see the collapse begin? I didn't. Try rewinding the video a few times. It's pretty boring. There's not the slightest hint of any collapse until frame 40. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. There's a tiny motion of the corner of the West Penthouse at frame 40. Then there is no more motion until about frame 46. Note that the motion of the penthouse precedes the movement of the roof line. There is no measurable movement of the roof line until frame 46. That's a full second beyond frame 16. Even then, there isn't any progressive ongoing movement of the roof line until about frame 60. By then, we're back to just over 3.9 seconds of collapse time, or in other words, the onset of freefall. The only rationale I can see for choosing frame 16 to start the clock is to make the measurement come out to exactly 5.4 seconds to agree with the prediction of NIST's collapse model. But what if I'm wrong? What if they did see some tiny movement on a clearer version of the video? That tiny movement, whatever it might have been, did not last. It would have had to have been a glitch, and the scientists at NIST would recognize it as a glitch, because there's no measurable difference in the height of the roof line for the next 20 to 30 frames. What can we conclude? You can draw your own conclusions, but I think it's pretty clear the whole idea there was any kind of real 5.4 second collapse interval is a fiction. 
It's a crude fabrication, and the three-stage collapse sequence is pseudoscience in the service of an ongoing cover-up. In part three, we will return to the central question. In conceding freefall, what has NIST actually admitted?